360 degrees. High high, 360 degrees. High high, 306, 306, 360 degrees. High high. All right, miyuyam, miyuyam, cho onam, and namokiyam to Full Circle, your cultural affairs radio magazine produced by members and graduates of the First Voice Apprenticeship Program, broadcasting from right here at KPFA in Huchin, occupied Ohlone territory, also known to settlers as Berkeley, California. And this week on Full Circle, we feature three different stories on tonight's show, we'll hear from the Battle at People's Park here in Berkeley. The historic park is again under threat of development. And we have voices from yesterday's rally and an interview with uh, one of the park defenders, Andrea Pritchett. We'll also hear from J.R. Valray, one of the new contributors to Full Circle, and his interview with BART Co. Director Latifa Simon about some of the things that she has worked on in the Bay Area Rapid Transit System since being elected to that board. And to close out the show tonight, First Voice is collaborating with youth from Moving South Berkeley Forward. We'll hear one of the first interviews from the group. All that tonight on Full Circle. I'm your host tonight, Natung Freewill and Franklin Yaka, coming to you from downtown Antioch, this is Occupied Bay Miwok Territory. Keep it locked right here to KPFA. Yes, again, Miu Yum, Miu Yum, Noshun Lovic for joining us tonight on Full Circle. And tonight, we're going to kick it off here in Huchin, a.k.a. Berkeley, at the historic site of People's Park where the prized piece of land is again being threatened with development. Uh, People's Park is listed on the National Register of Historic Places and was already the site of a battle between uh, the UC system of Berkeley and the Berkeley community in 1969, when at that time a major confrontation between student protesters and police led to the shooting of James Rector, who was actually fatally shot by police. That was May 15th, 1969. Well, police and protesters again faced off at People's Park here in Berkeley in the early morning hours uh, before sunrise on Thursday. Seven people were arrested in that overnight action. Um, After the park was cleared, workers began erecting what is being described by activists as a border wall constructed of overseas shipping containers, and they're stacked one on top of the other too high. Um, Later, Thursday, just before noon, nearly 200 people gathered at Haste and Telegraph Avenue in Berkeley to protest that overnight action by UC Berkeley to evict parked protectors and people from the unhoused community that were staying in People's Park. Um, At the rally, different speakers took to the megaphone. I got some of those voices. We'll hear from some of them. And then we'll be right back with an interview with Andrea Pritchett one of the community activists defending People's Park. Stay tuned. Stand up right back when People's Park is under attack. What do we do? When People's Park is under attack, what do we do? People's Park is under attack, what do we do? I think it's very convenient what we saw on social media in the middle of the night come from the UC Berkeley official social media accounts, a very well curated, uh, very image of the plan to take down People's Park and replace it with low-income student housing is a really smart divide-and-conquer tactic to pit low-income students against unhoused people, people who have a common goal in mind. This seems like a very strategic move from Carol Christ and the rest of the university, and to that I say, shame on you! Shame on you for pitting your low-income students against unhoused people in the city of Berkeley, a historically sanctuary city for unhoused people. UC Berkeley is undoing the legacy of supporting, to a better ability than many cities, 
unhoused folks, and that is causing deep harm to our community. No justice, no peace.
All right, Free Will and Franklin back here on Full Circle. And we are now joined by um, one of the activists that you heard speaking yesterday outside uh, People's Park there at the corner of Haste and Telegraph. And that is a local friend to the station, local community activist, cop watcher, musician, so many things, Andrea. Um, Andrea Pritchett is joining us today. How are you doing today, Andrea? I'm okay, Frank. Thanks for having me here. And um, I got you on because I know you've been in the midst of the battle to save People's Park um, for a long time. Um, let me get your thoughts on what's going on first. Let me hear your thoughts on the message from UC about um, the park being a haven for homelessness, drug use, and um, the way that they're putting their messaging out and the need for student housing. Well, I can say this, that it is true that, that People's Park has been a refuge for people in need throughout its history. So rather than blaming people for their mental illness or, or substance abuse issues, they've always been welcomed. They could always get a meal there. They could always get some support there. And miraculously, the community around People's Park provided with, with no resources provided support and care for hundreds and I can say thousands of people over the years um, with no help from the university, with no help from the city. And this is what, and, and as is often the case, you know, the oppressor blames the oppressed for the, for the impacts of, the, of oppression. You know, yep, we had poor people there, guilty as charged. Yep, we tried to help them. Yep, that's our community. And that's a community that goes back, yep, a couple generations. And um, so we make no apologies. If this university failed to provide help, yeah, that's what they did. They neglected the park for years and years. Matter of fact, they made it, a, they made it, they threatened it uh, with a slap suit, a strategic lawsuit against public participation that was created in, I think, 1992 to stop people in the park, supporters of the park, from making improvements. That's right. They said that if you build anything, if you alter anything in the park, you could be subject to a lawsuit from the University of California. That's pretty intimidating. So when you look at, like, even despite that, people continue to garden, continue to maintain the free, the People's Park free speech stage, continued to try to help folks. And yes, the park became a refuge during the pandemic, you know, for unhoused people. Yep, that's where they that's where they went. Where were they supposed to go? You know, well, uh, talk about some of the history, because this is not just a battle that started um, this week. This has been ongoing. Um, talk about the last big battle that you were part of for the park. And you mentioned the guard in the stage. Talk about what has, um, after you talk about the battle, tell us about what has grown there, the garden, the trees, and what's become of it. Yeah, well, I mean, from, you know, back in 1969, when the park got started, you know, people planted trees. And those trees remained until this most recent chapter. The creation of the park is a labor of love, is, is the labor of volunteer volunteers who put their hands in the soil and wanted to make something beautiful grow. Sometimes it was vegetables. Sometimes it was native plants. Sometimes it was beautiful fruit trees. You know, it's all there. It all was there. One of the major struggles was back in the, in the 90s. You know, people have to realize, though, and this is, this is a cause for hope, in the early 70s, the university came and they said, all right, all right, enough of this park. We're going to pave it over and make, make a proper parking lot. And they paved it, and the people tore up that asphalt and reclaimed that land yet again. And then the university came and they said, no, 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 we're going to build volleyball courts because what we really, really need is more sand volleyball opportunities for our dear, beloved students. So using ancient redwood trees and 900 cops in that chapter, they, you know, with claims that it was broadly supported by the community, they occupied the South Side area for a couple of years. And they tried to, you know, make it, 
you know, after they installed this this volleyball court and they created this outhouse, you know, this giant quote unquote bathroom structure that never was able to be used as a proper bathroom. It was never maintained. It was when the faucets did never worked. They never you could never wash your hands in a people's park bathroom. And then they blame us for being dirty. <laughs> you know, that's the university. Um, but they they built these structures. And after about five years, they they tore them out because they couldn't maintain them. And because strangely, oddly, unhoused people were not that interested in playing volleyball. They had other concerns. So the university is, has a real talent for just being absolutely insensitive to the actual needs of the community, to the actual needs of the people surrounding that campus. And I can speak as, a, as an alum of UC Berkeley. UC Berkeley is a corporation. UC Berkeley has, has, has you know, students are mere window dressing to the research and development, to the corporate nature of the university. A university that, whose charter says that every Californian has a right, a right to higher education in the university system. That's in the charter. Sadly, over the years, what we have seen is the privatization of that public commons, that that the university and its departments have compromised their academic freedom so that they can pander and get donations from BP and corporations and, uh, and the government and the federal government. And so they've compromised their mission Students just sort of, you know, the, uh, what I learned at UC was this. I learned how how privatization and colonization occurs. And now as a resident of Berkeley, I'm living it. And I'm watching them with the collusion of the mayor of our, t of our town and the entire city council. You know, with some people, you know, some people protesting, but not too much. That they have, they have signed off on it. They have, they have agreed, yes, we're going to purge our city of poor people. So all their, all, their, all their claims, they're just such a bunch of hypocrites. They're just such pathetic hypocrites. Rigel Robinson, he's the, the city council member for our district. And he, <laughs> and he, not only did he sign off on this proposal, but where is he now? When 1,400 cops invade his district, he who would be mayor is nowhere to be found. Well, let's talk That's about leadership. that. Let's talk about that for a second, because yesterday during the demonstration, you called him out and it seems like someone was either there to speak for him or I, I would call him a heckler. Um, but yes, he, yes. he tried to um, call you out for calling out the district representative, Rigel. And right. um, he was an intern heckled back and shouted down. Um, but he said, Rigel's a great guy. He cares. And uh, he's not one of the colonizers that's signing off on this. Um, you kind of already touched on it, but where is the um, elected representatives here? And you mentioned it. Are they signing off on this? Have they just said, yes, build the housing. Uh, we welcome the high patrol and the other officers that are coming in. Um, how do you see um, the role of the city council as it should be from your opinion? And then what do you see them doing? You know, the point of a city council is to take care of its people, the people in the city. That should be their number one priority. Sadly, Rigel Robinson, at the same time that he serves as a city council member, was also, I think, in the Goldman School of Public Policy. Totally like, <sighs> excuse me completely um, beholden to the university. He loves the university. He feels like he's part of it, that he represents the university on the city council, as do most, most of our city council members are either alum or, or formerly employed, or you know they have relations with the university. They represent the university. And I'm still waiting for somebody to represent us somebody in our city who represents the people, because what's at stake right here is whether or not there's going to be a Berkeley that is in any way distinct from the University of California. The University of California, with the help of Gavin Newsom and bootlickers like Nancy Skinner, they don't see any limit to university growth. They're fine watching all of Berkeley's history and institutions and culture be homogenized and sanitized away and subject to market forces. 
You know, the fact that that they're not, you know, how many years have we lived in Berkeley claiming that there's a housing quote unquote crisis while allowing the university to import thousands more students into a situation of quote unquote crisis? Let's touch on that because part of the call is desperate need for housing for students. And as you mentioned, um, there's a lot of people love the university. You yourself are um, alum from uh, Berkeley. How can we love and embrace the campus and provide um, housing for students? What's the um, what's the boundary here? Are there other places to build? Is there um, you know what are your your other solutions uh, to bring to the table to say let's keep this park as the historic landmark it is? Let's use it for the betterment in the community and let's build over here. What do you got? Well, the university first of all has many other sites that they could use to to build student housing. So the whole point of this of this charade is not to solve the student housing crisis. Let's be clear. That's a so, so that's a housing crisis that they create. That is a housing crisis that they profit from. That the construction of these buildings, that the rents that they impose, that's all that's all just a money making opportunity. That is not to relieve suffering. Because if they really cared about suffering, then the quote-unquote supportive housing that was supposed to accompany this project would not have fallen through. You remember, I don't know, you know, people, one of the ways that they sold this People's Park thing, it was a win-win because they're going to make 120 units of affordable housing for the unhoused people who live in People's Park. Now, first of all, that housing was never going to impact the people who, quote-unquote, live in People's Park because those people are 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 way low income. You know, they're talking when they talk low income, they say, well, if you make up to fifty thousand less than fifty thousand dollars a year, then you would qualify for hey, that's wealth. That's huge wealth compared to the people in People's Park. But that resources for community development, that developer who went along with the project and helped them soft sell it to the community, well, we're gonna do something for the homeless and for the students. Well, guess what? When the university came in in August, August 3rd of 2022, you know, with guns blazing, they came in and they cut down all of our trees and they destroyed so much of the park and so forth. Guess what? They were they were not authorized to make all those changes. They they hadn't gotten approval for that. And so that lack of approval led to a violation in in the in the terms of funding for the supportive housing aspect of the project. And so they got their funding pulled. So there's no supportive housing associated with this project at all. Nothing. And uh, mention that um, that organization again, the Resources for Community Development. Is that? That's it, RCD, yeah. And they were um, charged with uh, one of their goals, their um, housing. Um, they maintain and try to keep um, affordable housing in the Bay Area as well as develop it. Do you believe that they were like duped into it, they were thinking they were going to actually help? You know, I think that it was a very prestigious project for them. And I think that they got swept up, you know, and I think, and I know, I know the guy, (laughs) I know the head of it, I know his wife, and I know that they did not agree on that, on RCD's participation. You know, and it's, it's an age old question, you know, oh, well, this little, these little crumbs from the table, maybe they'll feed somebody versus let's upend this table and redistribute the meal you know let's let's totally you know change change the the structure and i don't think whatever so i don't i don't hold it against rcd let them go let them develop housing but not at the expense of unhoused people and that was the fundamental flaw in that project well uh, well let's move on back to the park again because as we speak and throughout yesterday um, they've been erecting this huge, uh, what has been dubbed a border wall out of these shipping yeah. containers. Talk about the actions that are happening with this wall. There's actually um, a court process happening right now, and they're not supposed to be um, constructing or doing anything. That's right. How do you see right. the move that they made, the construction of this quote-unquote border wall, and some of the destruction within the park happening when the court has yet to render a decision? Well, you know, and we live in the age of robber barons and Donald Trumps and folks whose creed is 
don't get permission, maybe apologize later. And that's the university. They Just like they did on August 3rd in, in 2022. They don't care about a court. They don't care. They've got the governor in their pocket. What do they care? So yeah, they're going to destroy. They're going to violate a court order. And the question now is whether or not the California Supreme Court will enable and approve the blatant disregard that the university has for the California justice system, for these processes. Yes, the university was authorized to build a fence, a fence, two story high storage containers completely surrounding the park so that we can't even look at the park at this point. With the 1400 cops they have, you know, putting the South side under martial law, essentially, we're not even able to, to monitor what's going on in there. I have no idea. I tried all day yesterday to see if the free speech stage had been destroyed. I thought it had, but somebody else said it hadn't. But we can't get close enough even to look. It's it's sick. But um, yeah, the university processes, the university absolutely has no respect for for what we do. And I and I I was thinking about it last night, you know. Property destruction? Is that a bad thing? I'm learning my lessons from the university. Are they empowered to just destroy property at will if it serves their ends? Apparently they are. Are they allowed to use brutal force in order to accomplish their political object objectives? Apparently they are. So I want to know what we're allowed to do. Are we allowed to do property destruction to achieve our political ends? You know, it's an open question at this point, but it's awfully hard to tell other folks, no, no, give peace a chance, sit in the street when the university just blatantly destroys the things that we gave, we gave years of our lives to build. Well, we're getting ready to run out of time here. Let's talk about what's next. Um, what kind of organizing do you see happening? Um, where can people, you know, uh, tap in and get connected? Um, how can people follow along and just um, be a part of it if they wish to? Yeah, thanks, Frank. That's a great question. Well, we, we have something called a, uh, a, you know, the bulldozer alarm, which is actually a text alert system. So if you text in all capital letters, one word, save the park. If you text that to 41372, we can add you and we can let you know when things are happening. You can also check www.peoplespark.org. There's also a People's Park Berkeley Instagram that is very, very current. So those are all great sources of information. You know, we're, we're strategizing even now. The students who are trickling back into Berkeley, they're not really going to be here until mid-January. So we're just trying to hold on the best we can. Um, but this struggle is not over, not by any means. The university, <laughs> they better, they better, uh, they better, you know, get themselves prepared because because what they've done here is such a gross violation. And you know, in this time where people are asking questions about, you know, well, what is colonization? What is occupation? What is ethnic cleansing? What does it mean to to make a population disposable? That's what Berkeley's done. That's what the university has done. And every time they make, you know, it just it, the, the bile bubbles up in the back of my throat every time I hear them do a land acknowledgement. Oh, they're so sorry about what they did to the native peoples of this area, but we're going to do the exact same to another group of people. Um, so, yeah, stay strong, stay tuned, because this struggle is not over. All right. Well, we're going to leave it there. Can you repeat the text um, alert system one more time? Yeah, it's uh, you text save the park, all one word, all caps to 41372, 41372. All right. And again, we'll post um, the number and the links on our website, kpfaapprentice.org just after the show where you could touch base with that Instagram, the website and sign up for those text alerts, which I am a part of. And it really helps um, to keep you informed. And um, I just say thank you to you, Andrea Pritchett for um, all you do, not only for the park, but for cop watch for all your years, your music and everything you do out there um, 
for the people in your community. We really appreciate it. And uh, I've learned a lot from you over the years. And um, I thank you for that. Oh, you are so sweet, Frank. Thank you. Thank you. For, and thank you so much for making this beautiful space on the radio. You're, you're just, we, we, we love you and need you so much. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Mac. And um, again, that's the voice of Andrea Pritchett. She's a um, Berkeley resident right there near um, in District 7 near People's Park. And she's also a musician, um, cop watcher, uh, so many things to list. And uh, again, we appreciate your work here and we'll keep in touch with you um, as this develops throughout the coming days, weeks, months. And uh, as you said, it's going to be a long battle. Amen. I'm in the streets like Ninja Cat, People's Park in Berkeley, California. Let's bring it back, a whole new era, a race of history. And I don't know what's scarier, but the more the merrier. Gentrification, things change up. We got behind and they blame us. Flip the coin, now I came up. Now I want more, maybe a corner store. Mm. I never had it before. Am I the problem? Can we get more? I gotta make my voice become a sword to cut down the trees, our elders is gone. First trophy, this is people's part. Shout out Christina, you know that I mean it. If you're from Berkeley, I know your soul is bleeding. People's talk. People's talk. People's talk. People's walk. People's walk. People's walk. People's walk. Hey, people's walk. Walking down Telegraph for Berkeley, this is the culture hub. Life changing, game changing. Things change, but who said I was changing? Unless you got tips on doing better. Other than that, I don't hear you. Berkeley, California, skate park, that's the culture. Over there by Whole Foods, y'all know it if I showed you. I heard someone at Thrasher said I wasn't the culture. I'ma have to show them. I heard someone at Vans said I wasn't the culture. And they try to act like that they don't know us. I see that and I got to show them. My kick flip the tell them. I'm really punk rock. You can catch me at the Gilman the waterfront. Reppin' this Berkeley, California. That's real. And I don't know if they understand how I really feel. That's real. And I don't know if they understand how I really feel. It's little beat. All right, welcome back to Full Circle right here on 94.1 FM, KPFA and KPFA.org. And we're also on First Voice Media on Facebook where we post all of our shows and our video content. We did have to cut the audio from the uh, People's Park protest a little short, but that entire video is posted on First Voice Media. Um, just before I came back, you heard the song People's Park by Little B. And before that, you heard an interview with People's Park defender Andrea Pritchett. And again, a quick reminder, um, I will post the links and information, including the text message alert system Andrea spoke of on our website, kpfaapprentice.org. That's going to be late uh, tonight or early tomorrow morning. Also, a quick reminder, we did post all those videos um, that we have about People's Park on the First Voice Media Facebook page. That includes two interviews you didn't hear tonight. One of those interviews is with uh, Osha Newman, of one of the creators of the historic Telegraph Avenue History of Telegraph Avenue mural that's painted on the side of Amoeba Records. So check that out on the Facebook up next, we're going to throw it back to uh, one of our more recent contributors to Full Circle, J.R. Valray from the Ministry of Information. J.R. recently did an interview with BART co-director Latifa Simon about some of the things that she has worked on in the Bay Area Rapid Transit System since being elected after the BART police murder of Oscar Grant. She talks about her past in activism and how she has transitioned into fully doing legislation and advocacy work on behalf of women, 
people with special needs, black and brown folks, and others. So stay tuned. We'll be right back on Full Circle. You are listening to J.R. Valre on the Ministry of Information. Today, our guest is Latifa Simon. She is a member of the board of directors of the Bay Area Rapid Transit. She was also a MacArthur Genius Award winner while she was the head of the Young Women's Freedom Center, among other things. She's a legend, and I'm honored to have her on the air with us. What's up, Latifa? I think you're the legend, JR. What's up? How are you? So good to be on the phone with you. As always. Thank you for coming on. I wanted the people to know a little bit about your history when you took Mm -hmm. over BART. I mean, you came into Mm -hmm. the Bay Area Rapid Transit System right after the death of Oscar Grant. Can you give the people some context into what you was coming into, why you ended up doing it, and how has the ride been? I love that. How has the ride been? You know, the story in some ways starts with the morning after Oscar was killed. And I was literally in my bedroom with my little baby between myself and my beautiful late husband, Kevin Weston. And he woke me up and he said, the police, our police killed somebody. And the days after that murder, I remember, of course, we had all witnessed in our lifetime police sort of the savagery of police involved shooting but there was something in Kevin's eyes where you know he said I would never ride Bart again and the rage and the 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 watching the news every single night and the images coming out of new American media you know you were a part of that crew when you all found those young people with those phones that was you all and seeing what the national media had kept away from so many of our eyes for so many years having those young people film that brutal assault that murder of that young man. They filmed, you know, Officer Peroni calling Oscar Grant, who is now an ancestor, a bitch-ass nigga. And I say that in quotes because the butchery, uh, the lack of humanity that those officers had for those children, they were in the early 20s. And remember, when you're in your early 20s, you're still a college-age kid. Uh, But black boys don't get that type of humanity um, pretty much from anybody. So, you know, being with a black man, raising his little baby, watching every single day for the first couple of weeks after that murder, the disheartening tears, you know, from him and our whole community and particularly from Wanda Johnson. You know, I'll never forget that after losing Kevin to cancer and pretty much losing everything, I had a thought that, you know, what I needed to do after going through what we had been through was to do continue the work of our family. And thinking about running for Bay Area Rapid Transit District, again, I'm a transportation-dependent person. I'm legally blind. I've never driven a car. But particularly when I was first talking about the possibility of running, not just to amplify transit justice, but thinking about BART as an institution that goes across, you know, I knew at that time five counties. They were about to come into Santa Clara County, making it the fifth. They had their own police department. And its budget was akin to the city of Oakland's budget at about $2 billion dollars. And not a lot of people knew about the bar board in our communities outside of, again, the murder of Oscar Graham when people like yourself and others started charging the board every other Thursday to demand justice for Oscar and his family. And I had all of that in the backdrop. And when I decided to run, I had no idea that, wow, I would have to campaign in 19 cities. Oh, my God, I'm going to have to raise almost a half a million dollars. You know, I needed to get on TV. I needed to get on radio. I didn't really understand that. But once I was given the task, I said, I want to do this because clearly, you know, being from the Bay, BART is hella Bay. It's the iconography of BART. Uh, But also there's there's so much history that I learned later about, you know, BART steamrolling through black communities and disenfranchising our communities. And it's police force, you know, being uh, labeled, uh, you know, across counties as as, uh, turning their backs on their jobs to actually protect. We, we, we all knew that. So running and winning, when I ran, I said a couple of things that I wanted to do when I was campaigning that, you know, the, the police department needed to be completely transformed. And a majority of the issues that are faced on BART that had required policing didn't need armed policing. That you know, in my campaign, I was pretty clear that I wanted to establish a non-armed safety force on BART. And I had named it the ambassador program in my campaign. Um, I also wanted to make sure that BART was more affordable for young people. And when you 
reached the age of 12, you know, prior to my election and winning, you had to pay full price for BART. I wanted to change that. That was ridiculous. Folks like myself, my first internship at Youth Radio, it, when Youth Radio used to be in Oakland, I was 13 and I was hopping BART every weekend to get to that internship and got one of my first citations ever. And it, at that point, it was a criminal citation. It wasn't a civil citation. And again, the cost and the time tax of being poor, trying to ride public transportation, which is a public good, I knew I wanted to sort of address that immediately. And then lastly, you know, thinking about, again, the the idea of being black in leadership and being transit dependent, being on a board that so few people knew about, that I would be able to take up issues that other folks were too nervous to touch, like making BART the first of its kind in terms of a, a transit institution that was a sanctuary institution, meaning that right when Trump was elected, um, we knew that he was using Amtrak and Greyhound, both private institutions that were publicly funded to be a part of his deportation machine. I, when as soon as I was elected, you know, a number of things that I started, again, introducing the ambassador program, fighting for two years to get it in. But my first win was making BART a sanctuary transit system to ensure that the federal government, that we would not cooperate with the federal government on any issues that had to do with deportation, that we, they would not commandeer our police staffing to call for people's papers, that we, we wouldn't have anything to do with really what the Trump administration and the DOJ were doing. And then, you know, shortly after, about a year after I got on, I also was able to push and make real a 50% discount for young people over the age of 11 to 18. And so, I mean, I, I've been able to do a lot of other things, which I can talk about, but it made it so clear in this very consequential role that very few people knew about that we could make change that affects real people's lives. I think that you have been a major blessing to the black community in particular, but communities of color, women and other groups that you've been representative for. You, you have stood straight up for us and we definitely appreciate that. But what I think that is not talked about enough is the part you play in the special needs community, you skipped over it mm -hmm. with you being mm -hmm. legally blind. Can you talk a little bit about you being black and having special needs? And a lot of times when people talk about the special needs community, they talk, they're not talking about black people in particular. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So can you talk a little bit about that experience being a director and how that worked out for you? I love that because, you know, it's, it's, um, I was a preemie, you know, everybody knows me. I got bad eyes. I walk in the room, they're like, what's well, even right here? I'm like, okay, I see you, I see you, I see you. Uh, being born with a disability is in some ways a blessing because you never know what you didn't have. But I, I, I want to say that special needs and our folks caring for those in our communities with special needs is not new. How many, um, you know, grandbabies have to stand at the parent paratransit stop with granny while she's going to go to dialysis or how many of us are on the BART with, you know, our, our children to go to a therapy appointment because they have trouble listening and apprehending information in school and they may have a learning difference. Special needs and learning differences in our communities are extremely prevalent. Uh, however, there are very few advocates that are talking about the deaf and the blind and the, the learning impaired. In California, actually in the Bay Area, we have a California school for the deaf. We have a California school for the blind. A majority of those children are kids of color, and they can't be sent to private schools or schools that just are, you know, privately funded that are working with those kids. Lower income families who have children with severe disabilities, they are often sent to these schools that are far from their home so they can get the kind of education that they need. I've loved, you know, integrating the conversation about transit dependent people in our conversation about transit justice. As part of my role on BART, you know, so many of the issues that come to us, like paratransit, are, you know, this is state funded and county funded. This is a service that all disabled people need to be able to go to the doctors, to be able to associate with their friends, to be able to go to and fro. Those are basic civil rights. The other thing that I think is extremely important that a lot of folks don't understand because we haven't been good enough in explaining is transit oriented development is so important, meaning if we're going to be building, we need to be building by BART. We need to be building by bus stations. There are transit deserts in our community. So you know what that means? Is That means when young people don't have an opportunity to get on buses or trains that are low cost, they don't make it to school on time, right? If we can actually develop housing 
for low-income and mixed-use folks. That's close to transit. We help our earth, but we also make sure that people have the right and the option, you know, to be able to be connected. You know, one of the biggest, two of the big projects that, uh, you know, I'll still be working on in the next year, we are going to be building a development at, in South Berkeley. And the residents of South Berkeley, like Mama Ayana, who's helping to lead um, this development process, is making sure that this development is reparative. So upwards of 40 plus percent of the units will be for low-income people who were displaced, you know, through, you know, BART's you know, sort of horrific leveling of that district to bring those trains 50 years ago and their families. We're also, I'm also working with the West Oakland POD that will be developed by a black developer, Alan Jones. So, you know, having disabled people, having veterans, having homeless folks, having families be a part of these conversations of where we live, how we access transit is, it sounds super wonky, but think about, think about when some of us were living in Antioch before BART went out there. Think about, you know, like what, as black folks continue to be pushed out, you got to have a car. If you don't have a car, you can't get back you know, to, to Granny's memorial. Well, well, that brings, get back well let me ask you, that brings me something. that brings me to my next question. Why is transportation or why should it be considered a human right? Well, here's the deal. Mobility is a human right. <laughs> Mobility is a human right. To be stuck and unable to access basic needs, that is inhumane, right? To be unable to, again, like get on a BART train because you have court. And so then you're late and then you get locked up. That makes no, that, that makes no sense. I mean, even though there, there's so much to be done as of January, all low income people in the Bay area, if you get WIC, if you get food stamps, if you have section eight, if you get GA, you will be able to go to Clipper and get a a 50% off discount for BART. I'm talking indefinitely. That's like not just disabled people or youth. We're moving the conversation to say folks need to be able to access transit. It is basic as being able to access education, as basic as being able to sort of access health care. You can't really do any of that. If we're talking, if government is talking about climate goals, government is talking about let's get off the road. We're spending hundreds of millions of dollars on roads, but we're not investing in public transportation. Me not having a car getting my baby to school, making decisions on where I live, is this close to public transit? That is a reality that public officials haven't necessarily haven't had to contend with. Why it's so important that we are in positions of power, disabled folks, black folks, again, folks with differences, that so we get to make decisions that affect not only our lives, but folks who have similar experiences. Latifa, where can people get more information about what you're doing being on the board of directors, as well as where mm-hmm. can people get more information about you in general and what you have going on? Yeah. So you can go to BART.gov and right on the top of that website on the corner, it says board of directors. You can email me at any given time. I'm pretty close to my email. And um, you can also go to info at Um And I have a website that's talking about what I want to do both here with BART, but also nationally. I think it's important. All that is all that is our values, we've got to represent at every single level of government. And, you know, uh, JR, you didn't ask this question, but I'm just going to put it out there. We all have an assignment. You know what I'm saying? Like for most of my life as a young organizer, you know, I was in the streets every single day, you know, damn near with a megaphone, you know, yelling and screaming to get resources for mostly young women at that age when I was, you know, running the center to get out of prison and jails, I was fighting for housing. I've continued that work for most of my life. But, you know, I, I'm a woman of faith and I, I, you know, my daddy took Shahada at 21 and he would always tell me Allah is the perfect planner. And I realized that my assignment is not necessarily to be outside with a bullhorn. It is to strategically navigate spaces of power so that I could shift material resources to the people that I love. There are some really, you know, difficult things that you got to do to, you know, figure out how to be in those places, but that's my job. And I want to continue representing us at the highest levels and screening our hopes and our dreams in spaces where our people built, but were not made for us. Shirley Chisholm said it the best, bring a folding table, bring a folding chair. If they don't make room for you, It is incumbent upon us to be in spaces that are uncomfortable, that are spaces of power, that are filled with white supremacists who make decisions about our lives. 
Uh, my assignment is to figure out how to be in those places and not only be a voice, but to legislate, to actually change policy. And there, you know, there are others like me who are wanting to do this crazy thing of being in electoral politics, not for power's sake, but for our people's sake. And I'm, I'm just giving it all I can. Well, I think that your track record speaks to what you've been about, what you are about. Um, I've known you for decades and for decades, you've always had the people's the people struggle on your chest and we appreciate you. We salute you. And, you know, we're going to be marching with you into the future wherever it takes you. So thank you. You know what's so great about that, Jr. And I want your listeners to know this. Jr., you are you live rent free in my head. You are a consciousness, <laughs> um, and I I appreciate you so much because I know there's. I said in a video that I made, uh, you know, recently that politicians are not gods. I just would hope that the politicians come from some real struggle, but when we do go astray, because oftentimes you you know we're thinking about what we think is best, but it, it does take folks that really love us to shake us up, and there's not. There has not been a month, I feel like, in the 20 years that we've known each other that you haven't checked me on how to be better and how to stay on the ground and how to make sure that, you know, when when I'm walking past a grandma, I can look at her face and I can say, I'm trying to do right by you. So I really appreciate you, too. I love you, brother. You're family to me. And you also are somebody that I know, not just myself, but other folks, you know, you're going to have your foot on my neck consistently to make (laughs) sure um, that if I am, you know, continue to have platform and voice, that is real. So thank you, brother. Well, thank you. And as you can hear, this is a woman of the people. Get behind her, y'all. We don't have to put too much cream on it. Just get behind her. <laughs> There's not too many voices that represent the people. So let's do it. Latifa Simon is the name. We appreciate you, Latifa. She is the director or one of the directors of the Bay Area Rapid Transit, uh, BART. And among other things, she is a MacArthur Genius Award winner years ago, and she does a number of other things, but you will be seeing her name soon. So thank you, Latifa, and we'll talk soon. I appreciate you, Jay. Okay, bye-bye. All right, welcome back. You're listening to Full Circle right here on 94.1 FM and kpfa.org. Shout out to J.R. Valray for that interview uh, with Latifa Simon, co-director of BART. Up next, we're going to be featuring something new. Recently, First Voice has been collaborating with youth of moving South Berkeley forward, uh, working to advance their goals of achieving better health and nutrition for South Berkeley residents. South Berkeley residents have the lowest income and health statistics in the city of Berkeley and they are primarily people of color. Up next, we'll hear the first radio interview from one of the MSBF students, who's a part of the Media Learning Group. Hi, my name is Eduardo, and I am with First Voice, and may you introduce yourself? Yes, my name is Miss Haskins. I work with black and brown students at Berkeley High, we were engaged in a project that started out as a collaboration between Cal and Berkeley Community Gardening Collaborative. And we've been at this since 2017. Last year was the first year we collaborated with the staff from KPFA, First Voice Apprenticeship Program. And now we have a First Voice uh, program that's a part of Moving South Berkeley Forward. What got you into this program? I was asked several years ago, why wasn't there a gardening component that really focused with the um, high school students? Because Berkeley High at that time and at this point does not actually have other than BTEC as garden space for those who are interested in that aspect of environmental issues. And this project is a slash and environmental project slash social justice project. We're focusing on black and brown students from South Berkeley, aligning with the 2020 Vision Project, and we are encouraging students to become involved and interested in approaching the environment slash green economy so that they can be active participants 
in this new um, endeavor that deals with correcting past mistakes that were ignored. So this project is working on removing toxins used by the Santa Fe Railroad, property brought by the city of Berkeley, so that eventually there will be a green space in South Berkeley, and in that green space will be a youth-led community garden project that serves the South Berkeley residents, in particular those families and individuals who are below the median income in the city of Berkeley. How's the project going along? Well, it's it's a slow project, but it's worth it. It's and it's slow because it involves many layers. One, there's a limited amount of funding, and then the other, there is a limited amount of time that I have set aside that I can devote to the project because I'm also the project director for the city of Berkeley's community garden sites. That's it for now. And that brings us to the end of tonight's show. That was Eduardo Gonzalez talking with Kareen Haskins, the Moving South Berkeley Forward Project Coordinator. Remember, check out our website, kpfaapprentice.org, just after the show tonight. Um, actually, more like late tonight or tomorrow morning um, for archive shows and important links and information related to tonight's show, including that text alert system. Also, please like and follow First Voice Media on Facebook, where we post live stream videos and other material that doesn't always make it to the radio. Shout out to the Full Circle crew, Miss M, the executive director, and me, Freewell and Franklin. I have been your host tonight. I'm also the technical director for this show, Full Circle. Thanks for listening, everyone. And remember, while you're out there, to please protect your health and also your humanity. And stay tuned to KPFA. Up next is La Onda Bajita. Good night, everyone. One of the things I love about my role here at KPFA is I get to hear directly from you, our listeners. My name is Italina, Donor Relations Manager here at the station, and I get to hear things like, thank you for being here for our community. And we get to be here thanks to loyal listeners like you. So help us continue to be here by making a meaningful donation today. And no, there is more than one way to donate. You can make a qualified charitable distribution from an IRA, you can donate stocks. You can even add KPFA as a beneficiary. Thank you for being really thoughtful about this. Thank you to our monthly sustainers and to our generous one-time donors. Donate at kpfa.org or email members at kpfa.org if you have a question about donating in other ways or if you'd like to increase your monthly donation. My name is Italina, here for Community Powered Radio, here for you. Hi, this is Chris Hedges. When I'm in Berkeley, I always listen to KPFA because I do not want my news and information given to me through the lens of corporate power. KPFA is an absolutely vital organization within your community, one that keeps journalism alive and gives voice to those who otherwise would have no voice. Please donate what you can today. Hi, this is Roxanne Dunbar-Ortiz. In these difficult times, I cannot imagine living in this world without KPFA. We must support KPFA. Please donate what you can today. Thank you. Donate today at kpfa.org. You're listening to 94.1 KPFA, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, and online at kpfa.org.